Well, good afternoon and welcome to MedTech Crossroads. It is Friday, August 7th, and we've got a great uh, episode. This is the 20th time we've been together, uh, and it's a great, great episode today. Uh, first, some news. We're going to be talking about the late-breaking auto bio revocation of their antibody test. Similar story to what we saw recently with ChemBio. Uh, we'll get into that in just a minute. We're going to talk about the umbrella mask EUA. No, that's not an umbrella mask. That is an umbrella emergency use authorization for certain types of masks. We'll talk about that. After that, we're gonna welcome Christina Tamer from VentureWell to tell us about the Aspire program that's gonna be running at uh, TechTown Detroit, although virtually. And uh, we're gonna be meeting after that with Murray Godwin from SGS talking about uh, mask testing. Murray was uh, with us uh, very early on and uh, SGS got hit really hard with a lot of mask testing. So uh, it's exciting and he's got lots of war stories to share. After that, we're gonna do some education demystifying the number jumble. If you have run into international consensus standards and you're a little bit confused, we're here to help and we're looking forward to that discussion as well as some Q&A afterwards. So with that, what I wanna do is I'm gonna take you guys over to a couple of pages here from FDA. The first one of those is the auto bio revocation and sadly, uh, for all of us who want to see antibody tests out there and working uh, August 6th, yesterday, uh, they got sent the revocation letter for the AutoBio anti-SARS-CoV-2 rapid test. And this is a similar format to what you've seen before. If you've listened to the show, FDA lays out what the expected positive percent agreement for IgM, positive percent agreement for IgG, these are in the 80, 85, 88% range, positive um, predictive agreement for combined IgM, IgG. And they've laid all these out, and this is what the test was supposed to be able to do. And it meets the standards that FDA had set as what they were hoping for. But, and it's a big but this time, as we get down, apparently what they've been finding is that the IgM sensitivity was 50%, a coin toss. And so um, I'm not the biologist, so our biologist friends can confirm this, but if I do understand correctly, what we're saying is that this thing was probably under reporting present antibodies. If you had the antibodies and you took this test, there's a 50-50 chance that it said you didn't. And so the, the team there, I guess, tried to go through some things. Some of this is redacted. Uh, some of it is visible, tried to go through some things to try to salvage the antibody assay. Uh, in the end, FDA comes down here, a couple pages down, and they say, even assuming your theory were correct, this would indicate a design flaw that makes the test prone to error, and you'd have to pay so much attention to it as a testing team that uh, it wouldn't make it worthwhile. So they found that the auto bio assay needed to be pulled from the market. So ChemBio, AutoBio, uh, both those assays uh, pulled at this point, which is really kind of sad because I know everyone wants to be able to take a look and see, have I had COVID? And uh, this certainly doesn't make that any easier. We're gonna go over now to the Umbrella Surgical Mask Emergency Use Authorization. This one just two days ago. And some of you are saying, I thought we already had an umbrella mask authorization. I remember a few months ago that we were saying that you just had to jump through these hoops and you could put masks on the market. Well, we were, but those were masks that were not recommended for any particular purpose. It was just a mask. You could take something and you could put it out there as long as you labeled it in a certain way. What they're saying right now, if you look at this part in yellow, there, there are concerns relating to the insufficient supply and availability of disposal, disposable single-use surgical masks specifically. Now, I'm just hypothesizing, but given where all the masks have been going out and all the surgical type masks you've seen at Home Depot and everywhere else selling for $50 a box, I kind of wonder if a lot of the supply has gone out to the general public. But that's just hypothesis. But what they're saying is they're not getting enough surgical masks for hospital use for use in healthcare settings as personal protective equipment to provide a physical barrier to fluids and particulate materials to prevent healthcare provider exposure to respiratory droplets and large particles during surgical mask shortages. So uh, apparently we do have um, 
apparently we do have an issue uh, going on there uh, that we hadn't heard about until this uh, popped up. You're going to find some very familiar things in here if you're used to the mask EUAs. I'll touch on just a couple. Uh, they go through the standard criteria for issuance, which is very similar to what we've seen before. And a surgical mask that is not excluded for some of the reasons they talk about earlier, it's authorized. It's automatically authorized if it meets the following performance criteria. And these are fluid resistance requirements, flammability performance, particulate filtration efficiency requirements, airflow resistance requirements, and material requirements. If you got that, you can submit to FDA and they'll add it to Appendix A and you're in as uh, a surgical mask under this new EUA. I think we were wondering whether we would see a lot of new EUAs, especially ones as sweeping as this, uh, but here it is for surgical masks based on um, a lack in the market. So good to see FDA still working on that and uh, obviously of interest uh, if you're in the uh, surgical mask uh, area. So with that, I'm gonna stop this share. Uh, as long as we've just touched on both of those, uh, I will take any quick Q&A on that news because there's some interesting stuff there. Feel free to raise your hand. We're gonna give you about 10 seconds if you wanna ask a question now. Otherwise you can ask it at the end of the show. And with that, what I want to do next is uh, welcome our first guest, who is Christina Tamer, who is the Senior Program Officer for VentureWell. And uh, there's Christina. How's it going, Christina? Hey, Gene. I'm great. How are you? Thanks for joining us today. I'm doing well. I appreciate having you here. So when you and I were talking earlier, I had not realized that VentureWell has been, been around for uh, 25 years. Yeah, that's right. We're a 25-year-old nonprofit. We're actually going to be publishing our 25-year impact report towards the end of the year here. So we've been supporting science and tech innovators since that beginning and now, you know, more important than ever. That's awesome. And this Aspire program that you're, that you're running in, in concert with uh, TechTown Detroit uh, has been running since 2015, if I understand correctly. That's right. Yeah. So we've been doing lots of support for early stage innovators, you know, since our since our beginning, and we saw an opportunity to help innovators as they were moving on to raising their first rounds of equity. So we designed this program to support that. That's awesome. And you've got a presentation for us. You're going to share. I guess I want to ask you one quick question up front, which is for our audience. Um, obviously, there is a distinction here. You've got a company like uh, an entity entity like VentureWell. And you guys are, are, are playing in conjunction with TechTown. And I think a lot of people by knee jerk would say, oh, well, TechTown's there and it's got mentors and, and whatever else. H how is this synergy happening? You're not, you're not an office of tech transfer. You're not like we have in Michigan here, these smart zones. You're something else. Tell us just a little bit about the distinction. What makes VentureWell different from all the awesome entities that, that are out there? Sure, yeah. So we see ourselves as a supporter of all the other accelerators and incubators and other folks that are trying to support entrepreneurs too. So with this program, you know, we, we love TechTown uh, and the community in, in Michigan in general, and we wanted to help them um, by bringing them uh, our national network of mentors, our targeted specific programming around this stage. Uh, you can kind of compare it to like an intensive boot camp for fundraising, uh, and it gives it a chance, gives a tech town a chance to kind of showcase what they have to offer to a broader community. So we do recruit uh, both mentors and entrepreneurs from all around the country. So it gives exposure both ways. That's really cool. And I understand even though like under normal circumstances, even though you house Aspire in a given location for a given season, as it were, you're, you're bringing people in from all over the country. So there's that cross pollination happening, which is really cool. Let's have you bring up your presentation. I'm sure we'll have some questions as we go through, but we'd love to hear more about, uh, about Venture Well and about Aspire. Great, great. Happy to, happy to share. Uh, let me just put on the slideshow mode here. So, so yeah, thanks again, Dean, for having us. Um, you know, my name's Christina, as you said, and, you know, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, VentureWell and our program and what we're trying to do uh, and the problems we're trying to solve. And hopefully we can help some of you on the call or maybe some of you know an entrepreneur that could use that could use our help. So uh, as, as we said, you know, we're a nonprofit organization, 25 years old, and we've been working from the beginning to support early stage 
science and technology based innovators and entrepreneurs and the ventures that they that they launch to commercialize their inventions. Uh, and certainly we also support our peers and, and friends and neighbors in the ecosystem like TechTown Detroit. Uh, I think Stacy from TechTown is on the call as well, so maybe she can chime in if she wants at the end too. But um, you know, we're trying to help bolster everyone who's supporting science and technology innovators and entrepreneurs. And uh, as I mentioned, TechTown is supporting this particular program. We're also supported principally by the Lemelson Foundation. The Lemelson Foundation, uh, is their mission is to support inventors and specifically young inventors and inventors who are creating things that can have an impact. So that's been uh, guiding our mission since the beginning. You know, we got started together and we've been in lockstep on the mission since then. Uh, Venture is also supported by a number of different funders as well, like the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, the Small Business Administration uh, that support a number of other programs uh, beyond just the Aspire program. So the Aspire program is what was designed, you know, about five years ago to help specifically scientific founders uh, who are probably first-time entrepreneurs figure out what due diligence and fundraising and equity means, like how to actually translate what you've been doing in customer discovery into an investable venture. Uh, so it's a really targeted specific workshop uh, designed to help companies getting ready to raise their first rounds of equity. And these are testimonials from the program. And I think they do a good job summarizing what we try to do. Um, a lot of times an entrepreneur is having a conversation with an investor only in a high stress situation, like if they feel like it's their only shot, uh, if they don't make a good impression, they, you know, kind of miss their chance. So this program, you know, just kind of is an equalizer. It brings the investors and the entrepreneurs together, usually in the same room, this time it'll be a Zoom room, uh, to just talk to each other and help each other understand where the other's coming from. So uh, you get to hear exactly why an investor is ask asking the questions they're asking and help get a better sense of how to answer them. Uh, the program offers a lot of individual feedback because no two startups have the same problems. Certainly, we introduce the concepts that everyone needs to know, but then you get to go deep into the specifics for yourself. There's going to be different regulatory issues, different issues around equity splits, different issues around IT, depending on your specific stage and the specific things you're working on. So you get that individualized feedback. And, you know, we hear all the time that I pitched a demo day and someone asked me for my deal room. What is that? So we're trying to help demystify that and everything that will go along in that deal room and due diligence process. And as I said, it's a very specific time in the startup's lifetime that we're trying to serve. Um, you know, it's before you have the investors on board to help you with these things, but it's post, you know, customer discovery lean startup methodology. Um, there's tons of that out there and we, we teach it too and we support it and we love it. But this is for the, the startup that's emerging from that that doesn't quite have the investors on board yet. Oh, and I should just mention as well the outcomes. We've done uh, this program about 10 times, so 97 startups. They've raised a collective $95 million combination of equity and lots of um, SBAR awards too. And there's an 87% venture pers persistence rate. That's awesome. So, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll pause in a minute uh, to see if you have questions, but um, we really pride ourselves in the vetted national network of mentors that we're bringing. They are primarily active investors. You know, as an entrepreneur, leave with a very clear set of milestones and a clear ask and next steps and materials you can practically use uh, in your due diligence process. We also uh, walk through stress tests. So, disaster situations that we've seen derail companies that usually aren't related to the market or the technology, things like founder issues, IP issues. So we want you to be prepared for that too. As Jean mentioned, usually we would bring everyone together in person in Detroit. Uh, this time we're doing it virtually. So the commitment is over eight weeks, about you know four to maybe six hours a week, depending on how much time you put into the materials, but, but at least you know four, four and a half hours a week. Uh, Monday, we bring the whole cohort together for discussion. Wednesday is a one-on-one -on -one check-in with me or the other lead instructor. And then Fridays is either small groups or one-on-one -on -one office hours with the mentors. 
these are the things that you would work on during the course of the programs so on the left. These are all the things that you could plausibly share in a due diligence deal room. Uh, there are other things certainly too, and we would make custom recommendations for you on those. And then on the planning, these are all the things that can help you think through how much to raise, what legal documents do I need to be sharing? What does this amount of money bringing uh, you know, on our cap table mean for my equity ownership? So helping you plan and understand all those nuances. And then the next slide shows all the topics that we cover. There's a lot, um, but it, this follows the cadence of the, the Monday group discussion, the individual work product check-in, and then Friday is like networked learning. So you get to hear from a variety of different people, including peer entrepreneurs and the, the mentors. So for this particular program, this is who we've locked in so far as mentors and residents. So the nice thing about the program is that the mentors and residents are there for the whole program. They're tracking, there's continuity. They're not just sitting with you for like, you know, half an hour and then not talking to you again. You know, you get an eight week relationship with these, with these mentors. Two VCs, two angels, uh, an entrepreneur and a, an attorney and the entrepreneur and the attorney also dabble in angel investing as well. And then Eli and myself from VentureWell will be the lead instructors. And importantly, a shout out to the program team, our colleagues uh, who are wonderful at TechTown, Stacey and Paul, and then uh, my VentureWell colleagues, Kara, Dave, and Samer will also be helping too. So, you know, if you're interested, uh, you know, the deadline is August 17th. If you know someone too, please send them my way. Uh, it's an easy application if you're at the right stage, just your deck, a short technical summary, a short executive summary, and a cover letter indicating that you can commit the time as a CEO or as a member of the founding team. And we do ask for a, if you're accepted, a $250 registration fee per person, uh, just as a little bit of skin in the game. Certainly that doesn't cover the cost of the whole program. You know, we're a nonprofit, we're mission oriented here, but we want, you know, the, the accepted participants to, to commit to showing up. So I'll pause there and see if anyone has questions. And I have a slide with my contact information if uh, anyone wants to reach out. We actually do have a question right here. And then there's more we can talk about as well. But let me uh, let Ken Spencer on here to talk. Great. Yes. Hi, Christine. So um, one question I have is how flexible are you in the meeting times? And the reason I ask is that I, I work over at University of Michigan Med School. and mm -hmm. Uh, I went through i -Core, I think I was the second overall cohort and stuff on this, you know, and one of the problems with the i that they had to re figure out is how to involve uh, a lot of the med developments because the docs, you know, or yeah. and stuff like that. So that's always been an issue for us is, uh, you know, being able to get everybody to, the right people together, you know, for a specific time, given their, their schedule conflicts. Sure. Yeah. I hear that. We bump into that quite a bit, but, uh, we don't have a three person requirement like I for does. Uh, we just need the CEO to committing to being there for the full program. There is a bit of flexibility built in. The only unflexible part is this full, full cohort session to really like engage in the content you want to be there on Mondays and that would be between two and four Eastern Wednesday anytime on Wednesday you can check in and then Friday there's a bit of flexibility as well because the office hours you would pick the time that works for you uh, and then we can be we can work with you on figuring out the small group time that works for everybody so uh, the Monday two to four would be the would be the hard commitment okay thanks yeah, sure. Great. Good question. Thanks, uh, Christina. That's great. Yeah. And feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to ask uh, Christina a question. Christina, can you go back to the slide that has the outline of the of the program, that big table there? And I yeah. thought this was really interesting because when you and I were when you and I were talking, I mentioned that uh, into being a number of years ago developed a medical device development workshop. And I asked you, what's what term are you using for this? And you said, we're calling it a workshop. And I'm like, yes, because that's it's so it's so the right the right term to use for this kind of thing. And what I also find fascinating is when we start with a company, we're trying to develop a product, right? We're not developing a company necessarily, we're developing the product for the company. And the place where we have to start with them is what are your user needs? What is the, what is the user actually asking for? What is the business that's gonna go around this? That's gonna, we can't ask you about the cost of your product or anything else unless you know how you would sell it and what the cost would need to be to fit into a marketplace and how that fits into your business plan. 
And so I guess I can't recommend highly enough what you guys are taking people through because uh, when it actually comes down to the product, which is what everyone sort of wants to think about, all this stuff is what you kind of have to be thinking about to have a clue what product you should be developing. This really goes hand in hand. So, and we got to see firsthand the, um, some of the program uh, last year, I believe it was. And that's just, yeah. it's just really, really cool. So I can't recommend this uh, highly enough. So if folks do have um, contacts and you, and you say, um, you know, what are you doing? What are the dates again, Christina? It's, uh, it'll run from September 28th to November 20th. September and 20th. And the deadline's August 17th. Yeah, so if you got a startup and, and uh, feel like they, if you're a mentor and they could use a little more help with their business plan and what their company is, wow, can't recommend this, uh, this highly enough. So that's awesome. Um, take any more questions that, uh, that may come in here. If you got a question, raise your hand. Otherwise, Christina, what else should we know about Aspire or VentureWell? Yeah, uh, you know, as I said, you know, we're, we do focus really specifically on, on medical device and diagnostics for this cohort, uh, all, all med tech generally. So we are trying to bring investors that, you know, know the industries and aren't afraid of the, the hard stuff. You know, we won't, we won't have investors just focus on consumer apps, which are fun, but uh, that's not what this program is about. Um, you know, we, we know that there are long development timelines and challenges, so it's designed with that in mind. And I'll pull up my contact information here. Um, if you have questions, feel free to reach, reach out to me, and I will put the link to the how to apply in the chat box and our website as well. Um, so you can you can look around and, and see if there's anything else interesting. And I'm sure many of you know us, uh, you know, through i or other programs, VentureWell. It's a pretty large organization now. Uh, you know, we're 50 to 60 people. So people have bumped into us um, in many different ways. But this is um, one of our legacy programs now that we you know, can really get hands on uh, as a staff with the vendors. So hope to engage with some of you uh, in this program. That's wonderful. And tell us, is the is the deadline uh, before the seventeenth or by the end of the seventeenth? Because I know there's always some people in, in who are who are saying, "Oh, I've got till the seventeenth," and then it's going to be the evening of the sixteenth, and they're thinking about it. So, when's the deadline? Yeah, it's the end of day on the seventeenth. So end of day on the seventeenth. Okay, so yeah. that gives you about about ten days. Uh, yeah. Don't don't use them all right now, um, and uh, and that's just that's just great. Um, I did open uh, Stacy Frankovich's uh, line just in case you wanted to add anything, your partner at, uh, at TechTown. Um, Stacy, got anything to add to this? Hi, everybody. Hey, Christina, you did a great job. Um, hey, Stacy, thanks. No, just that if, you, if there's any questions or anything I can help with, I think I threw my email address into the chat, but I may have thrown it in for panelists. I'll go in and put it in for all attendees. Um, but if if you don't feel like VentureWell might be the program for you right now, that you're not that far along, um, there are all kinds of resources that MedHealth can help you with to get you to that place so that you could do it next year. So if there's any additional questions, feel free to reach out to me. Great, well, thank you for that. We appreciate that uh, thank very you. much as well, Stacy. And thank you, Christina, for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. And I hope everyone who's listening will uh, direct folks to, uh, to Christina for the Aspire program uh, starting in September. Uh, one note Great. for you here, appreciate Jean. You being it looks like there is a question for Chris Christina here um, in the questions. And if we can quick answer that live, um, how do you protect IP during the workshop? Oh, thank you, Steve. I appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Steve Minus. Yeah, yeah, so on IP, so, you know, certainly, you know, we don't want you to be sharing anything that uh, is not, you know, that you're not comfortable sharing. Uh, that said, there's definitely a culture of trust and repu being reputation oriented. Uh, so people should be respectful. Everyone participating should be respectful um, that this is a safe space. But that said, we're, we're not digging into like how the technology works in this workshop. We're on trying to understand the problem you're solving, who you're solving it for, and the venture that you're building uh, to commercialize that, that solution. So, um, you know, specific technology considerations shouldn't come up uh, in terms of how it works or the secret sauce or anything like that. Uh, in an investment context, that would only come up in, in very late stage due diligence. And, and even then, you know, you don't have to share anything you're not comfortable sharing. That's great. So, but the conversation does have to be 
not uh, not confidential. Right. Good. Steve, thank you for bringing that up. Really appreciate it. That's why we've got uh, folks like Steve Minus here behind the scenes uh, keeping track of stuff uh, for us. So appreciate that, Steve. And once again, Christina, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks again. That's great. And I, I can't say enough that when we're developing medical devices for people at Into Being, one of the first things we sit down and we say, well, we're going to work on design controls. We're going to work on design inputs. What, what, what are the user needs for your device? What are the, what's the business plan that goes around it that's going to drive the cost of goods so we know how much this thing has got to cost? And uh, when a company can tell us that and can sit down and start to dump out some of the stuff that uh, VentureWell and Aspire are going to be working on in that workshop, oh, it makes our life so much easier. So I can't, uh, I can't recommend that uh, highly enough. So I hope you all get connected. Next up, I want to welcome our friend Murray Godwin with SGS. I think Murray's having a bit of a video issue today, but he should be able to uh, come live on audio with us. Let's see if this will work. Murray, are you there? I am here, if you can hear me. I'm not so we, sure about the video, but. We can hear you just fine. Um, and I think we'll, we'll not worry about your video because I, I know you're going to do a screen share with us, but I just wanted right. to set this up a bit. Murray, you've um, been uh, an attendee on um, when, back when it was COVID Connect, and we were talking about all sorts of things. And a lot of people found out about um, SGS. Uh, we found out about SGS through uh, this community form of getting together. And as I understand, over the last number of months, you guys have been swamped. You do, you do testing of, of a number of things, which you'll tell us about, um, but you've been swamped with that. And I just thought it'd be really fun to have you on the show to tell us some of what you guys have learned, because in some ways, the, the demand for your services just went up overnight, if I understand correctly. Um, well, it, it, yeah, it, it had kind of always been there, but uh, I, I guess really uh, March and April, it, it exploded. We, we figured that it would, of course, uh, yeah. and there have been peaks and valleys since then. But uh, yeah, we, I, I'll say this, we have a number of facilities that are doing these things uh, across the United States, um, and we're not beyond our capacity, let's say it that way. Um, the folks that I work with in Appleton, I, I talked to them this morning and uh, they are, they're telling me we got a lot going on, but we're not, you know, we don't have too much going on or so much going on that we would turn anybody away. So it's a good thing and a bad thing at one time, I guess. Um, you certainly got, you got some uh, notches on your belt from this whole, uh, this whole surge and now you're ready to tackle more. That's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the whole point of, of, of coming in and, and uh, getting some information out there so that people know who we are and what we're doing. That's uh, great. Well, go ahead and share your screen with us. I know you've got a little presentation to, to take us yeah, through. We'd like to know more about SGS. Basic in information, I think. Uh, give me a second here. Let me get it rolling. If everybody's going to see it the way I see it, I'm not sure. I think we're seeing uh, it. And if, if not, somebody like Steve will let us know. Okay. So SGS, if you're not familiar with SGS, uh, our main headquarters is in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, our North American headquarters uh, is is based in New Jersey. I'm working out of the office in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, that particular office was born out of the paper and non-woven industries. And a lot of what with medical PPE especially is coming from that, that sector as well. So what we've, what we've come to realize uh, when COVID hit us is that a lot of what already exists out there for testing, uh, uh, you know, the standards and the protocols that are in place uh, we knew that there may be, a, you know, some exceptions that have to be made that's been kind of changing as we go along here. But what I wanted to show you first, uh, this has just come out from our headquarters. It's basically an informational flyer that they're using, and uh, they kind of hit, wanted to hit on some of what's going on in different places. So we talk about medical PPE, <laughs> what we're doing, and what we're able to test and what we're working with. Uh, things like eye protection, face masks, of course, disposable and reusable and gloves. We're not seeing a lot of that being tested. That a, lot of, a lot of the gloves, uh, I would expect more than what we, we have seen. Mm -hmm. uh, gowns and coveralls have been a big one for us, especially coming from uh, some of the uh, people that have jumped into this since the pandemic started. Uh, you know, you've had a lot of smaller companies jump into the fray, uh, wanting to be a part of, of helping to get the PPE situation squared away. 
uh, you know, in, to, to help in the production and everything. So a lot of that has been uh, gowns. Uh, the masks and respirators, um, these are the more complicated type, not the simple little face barriers that you see or the N95s that you may be able to get at a retail uh, facility. So in the USA, we're looking at medical gowns and gloves being tested under these uh, protocols, the face mask protocols. As I continue, surgical filtering face piece respirators. What you're seeing in this list is basically, you know, a, a matrix of this is what we're seeing the most of. In Canada, uh, you see some of the same things appearing even in the European Union, um, what's being tested for. Now, all of this, put it all together, SGS is a global entity and we have facilities all over the world. Uh, I, of course, focus on the North American market, but what I want people to understand, if, if you're in the process of making masks and PPE and those kind of things, and you need to find out about hey, I've got a European customer that's interested in this. We can walk you along or step you along the way on what certification or testing you need to meet certain European standards as well. So I just want everybody to understand that. We're not, you know, we're not restricted to just, just what's going on in North America. Um, so we can help you with that. I have included at the bottom of this slide my contact info, but at the end of this, I've also got a bigger one that you can see my contact info a little bit better. Um, so another matrix I want to show you, we talk about medical face masks. <clears throat> this is information that, that I can share with anyone who would like to see this. Uh, it's a series of spreadsheets, but it gives you an idea uh, when you're talking about medical face masks, a basic overview of what they are. Um, ASTM F2100 is the biggest of the protocols or probably the most common. And then in the, in the lower section here, we're showing you, we're breaking this down of where the capability is. Uh, like I said, we've got three main facilities in North America uh, that are, are working with the medical PPE. Um, so I don't want anyone to think that uh, by any stretch of the imagination, there's stuff that we will not do. There's some stuff that we may not be able to do by standards. Um, <clears throat> for example, the one test under a ASTM F2101, we don't have the capability for that particular test. We typically have to subcontract that out. Uh, the people that we have subcontracted that out to in the past are overwhelmed at this point. I will tell you that they, they have a lot going on. Mm -hmm. um, we move on to the N95 respirators. There is a note I wanted to point out here about NIOSH certification. Um, we can test the N95s uh, to standard of the protocols. The one exception that I would tell you, or the one thing I want to tell you, tell you, I guess in principle, uh, if you read at the bottom of that slide, we're testing to NIOS required methods only. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for doing that or a couple of things that, you know, it can be useful for you. What we cannot do is NIOS certification on the N95. And that's simply because we're not accredited yet. <laughs> um, that process has been started since the pandemic started that we're going to become accredited. It just hasn't happened yet. It's, it's caught up in a backlog of many, many, many things going on. Uh, with the organizations, I guess, that are, uh, are, are doing the accreditation. Um, we've seen an uptick in gowns. Mostly these are just the barrier type gowns. You can see what we're doing and where. Um, and surgical gowns, these are the ones that are the more robust that you would typically find in a hospital, you know, a more sterile environment. Anyway, what I wanted you to take out of all of that is this is this matrix is telling you all of the capabilities that we have uh, for doing these these particular items. <coughs> um, I did want to point this out as I'm segueing to the next part of this, I guess, uh, beyond the capabilities. What we have found, uh, Gene, you had mentioned war stories. <laughs> I, I guess that's a good word for it. Um, what we have found that had been a problem uh, for a lot of folks that are entering this kind of for the first time. Uh, I'll give you an example, there's textile factories in North Carolina that, uh, you know, back in March and April began uh, making face coverings, face masks, uh, but didn't really know what they needed to do uh, for having those tested or certified or whatever you want to call it. Um, how, this, how this all works for, you know, I guess to put, to make it as simple as possible. 
if we're testing something for you, what we, we're an independent lab, what we do is take the samples that you give us, we test them to the standard that you want them tested to, and then we send you back whatever it can be recovered along with the results. Um, but that doesn't mean necessarily that it's been certified or qualified for whatever you were having it tested for. So in looking at this form, when we start a project with you, one of the things that we're gonna ask you, uh, let me see if I can get a pointer working here. One of the things that I think that needs to be highlighted uh, in this process is you can call your test samples whatever you want to them, however you want to identify them, but what's important is the tests that are required. And what that means is if you've got masks or face coverings that are not in 95, you want to have them tested. You need to tell us. You need to be able to let us know what particular protocol we have to test that to. Um, now, I know that sounds just you know cold and hard, but there are a lot of people that we have helped out in that process. Like I was saying before, uh, people just coming into this uh, world weren't really sure what they needed to do. We can help you with that. So I don't want it to sound like you know we're washing our hands of it. We will help you determine what that is. Once those tests are done and that information is you know has been sent back to you, the the data, the results. At that point, who to determine? Uh, how you're going to certify that or who you're going to certify that with. My point there is we'll do testing, we'll give you the results, but we, we can't be the ones to certify it except for a particular protocol that is certified by being tested, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it does. And in fact, something we'll sort of follow up on at the end of this, because I think it's a really important point you're making that has wide reaching implications. It's not, it's no shortcoming of SGS. It's just something that companies need to realize. So I'm glad right. you're pointing it out. And I think it's just that people weren't aware, uh, especially mm -hmm. ones that are, you know, newer, newer to making masks and PPE and that kind of thing in, in the testing process. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, the point there is I want you to understand that, you know, we'll, we'll test it, we'll give you the data. Um, but that next step in having that certified is something that it's, it's, it's going to be on your end to determine what that is or how that works. <clears throat> so, excuse me, I'm getting a little hoarse. Um, here is my contact info. Um, I will help you with any, anything that I can in this. I am working with the three facilities that are doing this on a daily basis. I'm constantly in touch with these guys. <clears throat> and I'll give you a prime example. I reached out, I think two days ago to a customer in Mexico about a completely different, um, process in testing for a paper issue and a paper product for hygiene. And he came back to me right away and said, hey, we just found out we need to make masks. We're going to make masks. How do we test them? So that's kind of how it works. Uh, you know, if I'm reaching out to people on a cold call is one thing, but having the luxury of having a captive audience like this and these kind of webinars is, is outstanding for us. Um, the, the, the big thing for me is if I can help you with any part of that, whether it's doing something here locally in the States or trying to connect with whoever you need to connect for Europe or Asia or whatever we'll help you out. That's great. We just got a question here actually from Kate O'Hara. She said, uh, stilledlaborersbrigade.com. It's 500 crafters, sewers for PPE supplies. Do you test labor work? And I guess maybe one way to sort of distill that question down is, are you guys testing um, just sort of like pre, um, pre-clearance type of stuff? Or if somebody were wanting to send ongoing uh, samples throughout production to make sure that it was up to snuff and sna stayed up to snuff. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Both ends? Um, we, we're not testing only finished products and, and especially in the paper and non-wovens, we test the fabric. Uh, we test, uh, you know, if you know that you're going to have a run of so many thousands feet of a particular type of product that's going to be made into masks, we'll take a sample of that product before you start that run to make sure that it meets certification. Otherwise, you're running thousands of feet of stuff that may not be any good. Before so, you take 500 people and put them to work on this. So let's get it tested exactly. first. Exactly. In fact, that would be the recommended process. If you know that you're going, you're going to start this big uh, project with a lot of people involved, making a lot of things, let us test it first and make sure that it's okay. That's great. We'll make sure that you and uh, you and Kate are, uh, are connected. And actually, since you're a panelist, I think you can probably see her note there and, and, uh, and reach out directly. Okay. That's great. I'll just take, uh, if there's any other questions uh, for Murray, we can take them now. Feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions about the process of testing. I mean, what we've got here is Murray has got an a international uh, uh, company and they can 
look at all sorts of different things relating especially to the testing of PPE, but not exclusively. So if you got a testing question, it'd be a great, uh, great person to reach out to and, and see what direction he can point you. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions right now, Marie, but this is, okay. this has just been great. I do, but before you go, I do want to say that your question uh, really brought to mind something that we've seen over and over again. In fact, it's going to be the next section that we talk about here um, before we close out the show, which is what you put your finger on is as a testing company, you guys are, are responsible to be really good at, at running the tests, but you're not say the FDA. So right. folks are going to have to understand, okay, what am I coming to you looking for? You can help them with that, but ultimately it's going to be their responsibility to be the ones to make sure that all the right things get tested. Now, SGS is responsible to do the testing. And I right. think that's, it's such an important thing, but um, um, sort of what we're going to talk about next here is, uh, is this whole, this whole uh, what, what does standards testing mean and how does it apply to these, uh, these companies that are making new product? But I can't thank you enough for being on here and sharing some of your war stories and what you've learned. And um, we uh, hope, um, hope you and Kate can get in touch and, and certainly uh, continue to push people your direction uh, who have questions. Yeah, and, and thanks again for uh, for letting me be here. I'll come on every couple of weeks that I can and uh, do this kind of thing and, and talk about, uh, you know, progress and what we're seeing. Um, again, with my contact info there, if anybody's got any questions in general, whether it's about medical PPE or whether it's any kind of testing that we might be able to help you with somehow, by all means, let me know. Thanks, Murray. We appreciate it. Thank you. I got to turn the share off, I guess. There you go. You're, you're all set. Appreciate it. Well, it was great to have Murray on. He's um, certainly seen a lot over the last number of months, as, as have we all in different aspects. But what he touched on, that graphic that he showed of their intake form, and he said, you've got to be able to list the tests that you want done. Oftentimes, people don't understand that disjoint. You're a startup, you're working on a new product, and you say, there's testing I got to do. And, and you hope that your test house can say, oh, I'll just do this, do this, do this, and it'll all be fine. But of course, what startups discover is that that's, the test house is responsible to do the testing, to understand the testing, but they're not, in our case, the FDA. And what is the FDA going to expect? And how does that play with standards? I'm going to bring up a presentation here that we're going to go through here at the end of the show. And uh, we're going to talk exactly about that. We're going to talk about standards testing. So next up, I want to talk with you about 1345, 14971, 62304, demystifying the number jumble. And probably to you, that's what a lot of the uh, a lot of the numbers running past look like. Just a big jumble. Murray had a whole bunch up on his presentation that they do for mask testing. And sometimes these numbers are confusing. We don't just instinctively understand what they mean. We want to try to help you understand uh, that just a little bit better. So you've heard numbers like this, 13485, 1345, 14971. 62304. Maybe you've seen acronyms like IEC or ISO or ANSI. What do they mean? How do they relate to my medical device project? Well, before we go there, I want to take you back to a really common question we get it into being when we're doing medical device development. We often get from new startups or established companies, they say, how do I meet FDA's requirements to get on the market. I need to know what the requirements are. And it's really easy to imagine that there's almost like a long list that you just have to find somewhere and check the boxes. And once you get to the bottom of that list, your device is going to be on the market. It feels like that should be the case. And when you hear standards, it kind of feels like, well, oh, that's one, maybe that's one of the lists that I need. And there's some truth to that, but that's not really the whole story. In fact, up until recently, that was kind of how things worked in the European Union. That's a little bit of an oversimplification, but under the medical device directive in the European Union, which is outgoing right now, uh, and going into the medical device regulation, under the medical device directive, 
devices were often authorized on the basis of standards compliance. You find the standard that applies to your device, you meet it, you get your compliance blessed by the notified body working on behalf of the government. And that's changing as we go to the medical device regulation in Europe. They're actually moving to a system that's maybe more like the system in the United States. So here in the US and increasingly elsewhere, standards are important, they're very important, but there's some other things going on. There's often this concept of substantial equivalence in the 510K process where comparison to a predicate device already on the market is an exceptionally important part of your development and submission process. There's also an increasing focus really worldwide on a company owning and mitigating device risk independent of some pre-decided checklist. It's really, do you understand your risks, the safety and efficacy of your device, and can you argue for it? Sometimes using standards, sometimes not using standards. For higher risk devices, clinical uh, evidence can be, uh, can be necessary. So what are standards and what kind of a role do they, do they play? Well, at their core, standards are, are just that. They're standard ways of designing things and testing things. They're written by people with deep industry expertise. They're widely reviewed. They're maintained by standards organizations that keep a standard updated usually every, every handful of years. So maybe to understand how standards work, let's take two scenarios. Let's take the scenario of a Me Too product. Maybe you're making a product that's exactly identical to something that somebody's already made and had on the market for decades. Well, there's a chance that that has crept its way into the standards or in FDA's case, into the guidance documents. So maybe it's a case of meeting those standards or complying with those guidance documents, making your filings to the agency and going to market. There can be cases where it is that simple, but an awful lot of companies that I know are developing what are truly novel products. They're not looking to be Me Too. In fact, if they were trying to be Me Too, the investors probably never would have invested in those companies. And so risk analysis is gonna show novel failure modes. The technical details of your new product may differ from the ones that were anticipated in standards that may have been written for similar devices. Or maybe the agency, maybe the FDA has concerns that, are, that come out of the novelty of your new device. In this case, standards compliance uh, may be necessary, but it's usually insufficient to get you all the way across the finish line. And so um, you can think of standards as a way to reduce the number of questions that a regulator is going to need to ask you about your device. So for example, if a device has electronics in it, the IEC 60601 family of standards It'll go a long ways toward helping to reduce the number of questions that a regulator is going to have to ask you. A standard like 14971 gives us a uniform framework to talk about risk, but that doesn't mean all of our risks get solved the, the minute we read the standard. It does help us get on the same page to address what risks emerge and what risks are important. Now, FDA actually has a list of standards that they have recognized or what they call consensed. And that's available at this very long and very obtuse URL, or you can just do a Google search for FDA consensus standards database and you will find that address right there. That database was actually updated uh, within just the last few weeks. FDA did a uh, major update to it. And it's really FDA's way of saying we reserve the right to ask you any questions we need to, but if you comply with a standard here that's applicable to your device, we probably won't have as many questions to ask you. So it really does reduce the number of questions that are going to need to be asked about your device. So let's go back to the number jumble and the alphabet soup. The three letter acronyms on the right, like IEC, ISO, ANSI, are the names of the standards organizations. For example, ISO, the International Standards Organization. The often five digit letters, uh, so five digit numbers, sorry, on the left signify which standard is being referenced. So 
a few common standards include the ones listed on the left here, 14971, which is the risk management standard. It outlines a process for managing risk for medical devices. It's key to realize that no one is going to tell you what all your risks are for your novel device. But the standard, it gives a way of thinking about risks, deciding what risks need to be mitigated or addressed and ensuring that your mitigations are successful. It gives you a way to manage risk over the life cycle of the product. It's still up to your company to implement that risk management, but this gives you a framework for it. ISO 62304, this is all about the life cycle of software and how to manage it. So software isn't just written once and that's it and you're done. There is a life cycle to software and a frequent tripping point for companies is that there are aspects of this standard that are similar to FDA's software life cycle guidance document, but they're not identical by any means and have aspects that are very different. And so what you have to do to satisfy FDA may in fact not be exactly what ISO 62304 says, uh, which you're gonna have to comply with if you wanna go on the market in the European Union. So there's some interesting nuances there to understand where your market is and exactly how to comply with it. Sometimes the standards are largely similar, but they may not be identical. So 13485, that's the one you hear a lot. If there's one you're gonna to need to know as a medical device company, it's 14971, that is becoming a universal risk management standard. And many of the other standards depend on it. 13485 probably runs a close second. And that's actually not a device or a product standard. That is a quality management system standard. And it's based on ISO 9001, but specifically for medical devices. And like 62304, there are similarities between ISO 13485 and the FDA's quality management um, regulation, but they're not identical. And the differences are very important. The FDA quality system regulation is, is housed under 21 Code of Federal Regulations 820. And many a startup has falsely believed that if they just comply with 13485 or maybe their manufacturer complies with 13485, that they're all ready to go and quality systems are taken care of. And unfortunately, nothing could be further from the truth. Now that doesn't mean that 1345 isn't useful, that 1345, even in a US context, doesn't have its place. It can be a powerful way to make sure that your vendor, your manufacturing vendor, is uh, compliant in some way to reduce the burden of auditing on you but it certainly doesn't absolve you of the responsibility to comply with 21 CFR 820, which is the US quality system regulation. And so that's an important distinction too. We have next IEC 60601. We're just going through a few of the most common standards, but as you saw from a previous presentation, if you're going into mask testing, there are standards. If you're going into another area, there are standards. IEC 60601, it's a large family of safety standards that cover all sorts of medical electrical equipment. It's not only focused on the electrical aspects of the devices though. So if you have electronics in your device, you really owe it to yourself to get in there before you get too far into the design and start to understand which parts of the 60601 family apply to you and how to, uh, how to deal with them, because there are aspects of the design and testing of these systems that are specified in that standard. So if you get all the way through your design and then have to go all the way back, that can be an unexpected burden, especially on a small company. Last one we'll talk about today is ISO 10993. It's a venerable biocompatibility standard, but it was just updated in 2019. And with it, and there's a new tool in the toolbox. There's this thing called a biological risk assessment. And while it's very useful and it can be freeing in some ways because you can justify out of some parts of testing, it turns out that it can also be a little bit confusing and you often need the help of a third party test house to write the biological risk assessment for you. Um, the long story short here is don't believe that just because you picked uh, biocompatible resin to build your whole product out of that uh, you're gonna be exempt from biocomp testing. 
and understand that there's a few different stages now, especially since the 2019 revision. Some of it is argument and analysis and risk analysis for Biocomp, and some of it is the actual testing and understand that there is a process that has to be gone through there. So I guess in summary for uh, novel medical devices, compliance with international standards, it's, it's very, very important. It's often necessary, but it's rarely completely sufficient, especially when we're talking about the FDA. Standards compliance, isn't a, it's not a toss it over the wall after the design is done sort of a thing that you just get the test house to, to take care of. Uh, so you owe it to yourself to get familiar early on with the standards that FDA recognizes that may apply to you even before the design process is fully underway. It's really, really important. So I guess one last thing, how do you know whether the standards that apply to your device are sufficient to answer the questions that you'll be faced with? There's at least two things that come to mind and there's, there's other ways as well, but two ways. One is what we like to refer to as design controls because that's how FDA refers to them. It's a required uh, aspect of much US device development. It's often overlooked, but as you're going through the design control process of inputs, outputs, verification and validation, and the planning and reviews that come along with them, you're gonna start to see trends emerge. You're gonna start to see things that can be addressed entirely by standards. You're also gonna see things that cannot be. Risks or elements or performances that can't be addressed by the standards and have to be addressed in other ways. So you'll start to get an indication from that. And the second way is through the FDA themselves. FDA has a pre-sub program, especially if you have questions about the testing uh, regimen that you're gonna put your device through, it's often a good idea to reach out to the agency and find out, okay, this is the testing we're planning. Here's the standards we're planning to comply with. Do you believe this is sufficient in a future, for example, 510K submission. And that can be a very helpful discussion because you'll get an even better sense as to whether you're on the right track or not. So hope that helps a little bit as we talk about uh, international standards. Uh, feel free to raise your hand uh, in the uh, meeting here on Zoom if you've got a question about standards testing and standards compliance. And if you're watching this on a recording, feel free to reach out and uh, ask us here at Into Being about it. I do see one hand raised, we're going to go over to our friend Ken Spencer. Hey, Ken. Hey, Gene. How are you doing? Great. So listen, on the FDA side on software, have they actually issued uh, a standard? You know, because the last thing I saw was just like a guidance and they wanted comment and stuff back. And in particular, you know, with all the movement towards machine learning. I mean, it, that, what they even put in there was, didn't address that at all. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. And maybe, uh, maybe Aaron Carrick can pop on here and, and uh, give you some thoughts as well too. But FDA does not issue standards per se, like you noted, they do issue guidances. And while they often say the guidances are non-binding, they certainly usually reflect the agency's thinking. And so what you've encountered there is that the software lifecycle guidance um, that, that FDA has, it's, yeah, it's not gonna necessarily address some of those newer uh, concepts. I believe there is draft stuff on um, certain types of intelligent systems, but my understanding is the agency is still trying to figure out how to deal with some of those kinds of, of uh, emergent questions. So the, the best recommendation there would be to make sure that the software that you're doing is in compliance with the guidances that FDA has, because we know that their software lifecycle guidance, they do tend to hew pretty closely to. Uh, and where there are questions that aren't addressed by that, it's an important place to get into that uh, informational meeting or pre-sub meeting with the agency. But to, to have the argument together before you go in to know, uh, it's not just an open-ended question, hey agency, how do we deal with this? but rather uh, to really have an idea as to how you want to see it regulated. Good, any other questions on standards?
not seeing any others, I'm going to open it up. If anyone has a, um, oh, we did have an earlier, uh, we did have an earlier note here. I right, see if he's still uh, here. We've got um, looking back through here. Uh, is if Bob Becker is uh, still on the call, Bob, I'm going to um, open your line. I'd seen a, I'd seen a note from you earlier, and see if you want to ask your question live on the air here. Uh, you're muted right at the moment. Okay, we may be having a technical issue there. Um, oh, we got a hand, hand up though. Okay, sorry for the technical difficulties, folks. I'll give Bob another five seconds here. If Bob Becker is uh, available and wanted to ask a question about face shields, we would welcome you on. Your line is am I, am I now on? Hey, there's Bob. Bob, hey, how are you thank doing? You. Good, thank you. Thank you for doing this. It's been a while since I've been on. We're glad to have you. So short term when this all started to get my employees back, I started making face shields and sold about 50,000 of them and continued to make them. And um, the bad part is sales have been slow now and I've got about 200,000 of them in inventory. Oh, wow. So if anybody needs some, I definitely have them. <laughs> Um, and the risk, I wanted to make sure I was right on this. Once the emergency youth author authorization is waived, I probably wouldn't be able to sell these unless they're certified, correct? It's an interesting question. And I think the question you want to look into is uh, what other uses do face shields have out in the market? So, for example, um, when we're talking about respirators. So let's go there for a second. We all knew we could walk into Home Depot or Menards and we could buy a respirator. We could buy an N95 or something like that. And those weren't FDA approved ever. Those were NIOSH approved and that was it. And they were being sold for a specific purpose. Remember that FDA is not primarily a technology regulation organization. They're primarily a claims regulation organization. So if you're selling face shields, for a particular purpose like hospital use or um, having to do with, with COVID, that's gonna come under the EUA. I think something that would be worth looking into in a situation like you're uh, finding yourself in would be to ask the question, what else are face shields used for? If it's a non-medical market with non-medical claims, splash guard or something else like that, the question is where are those being used? And is there a market there and can you enter that market as well? I don't see this, uh, the need actually going away right now just because we were talking today about an emergency use authorization for more surgical masks. But that being said, uh, it sounds like this is sort of a market access issue and getting them out there quickly enough. Yep, thank you. Yeah, I hope that helps, great. We'll give a moment for any other questions or check-ins. If you're up to something, you want the community to know about an event that you're running or a question that you've got or something cool that's happening, you're free to check in right now. Uh, we give you that opportunity, just raise your hand and, uh, and people can hear from you. So don't, uh, don't be shy if it's something you'd like to do. Give about another 10 seconds and uh, see if anyone pops in. And not seeing any, I uh, want to thank you all for being here today. This was our 20th episode. It's so exciting to be able to connect the community together. I don't think there's been a single show where we haven't had some cool connection made that people went away and said, wow, that was really great. I'm glad that I, uh, I'm glad I had that opportunity. So thank you all for being a part of that. And thank you for uh, being here today. Have a great day.